Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is algebraic topology. Today's topic is kind of a wrap up of the section on homology that will show you kind of my favorite examples of uh, homology groups. Not quite my favorite example. So I think my favorite example is a homology ring of the Grassmannian, but it's also a little bit harder to formulate. So I kind of kick those off. And kind of what I want to make a list of examples that one should keep in mind when one thinks about homology. And what I'm going to do is, um, I'm kind of going to explain the cohomology rings. So the most subtle structure, the most important, arguably the most important structure on homology, cohomology is ring structure. And kind of from there, you would get the homology groups and the cohomology groups anyway. So I'm going to explain a list of cohomology rings and kind of indicate actually how you can prove that. Um, not, sometimes not so easy, sometimes it's, it's pretty straightforward. So these are usually very subtle structures, the ring structures on, um, on cohomology are very important. And they're really beautiful rings, as you will see. So um, the first starting point is, of course, the cohomology, the homology, whatever, of the sphere, which you can compute completely from the axioms. Really straightforward. You compute it from the axioms. You all know how it looks like. Uh, the homology and the cohomology is always something like z um, plus some t to the d, or n in this case, because I'm using sn, t to the n. Uh, Z. So it has only two components. One lives in degree zero and one lives in degree n. And yeah, and then that's something you compute just from the, the axioms itself. It's not so hard. And of course, then from the axioms itself, you also get the existence of this uh, cohomology structure and uh, ring structure on cohomology. And it's not hard to see that this is a graded ring in the sense that um, an element of degree n times an element of degree n will end up in an, as an element of degree 2n. But in this case, you, you don't have anything of degree 2n. So this just dies. So in the other words, the cohomology ring can only have one uh, appearance, one formulation. It's the best, or the easiest, or the nicest, or the most important quotient of the polynomial ring in one variable, namely just zx mod x squared. Slight uh, catch here. Um, or catch whatever. So this is a graded ring. So uh, the degree of this ring, the degree of this element actually depends on the sphere. So um, if you want to distinguish various spheres in the ring structure of the cohomology, you need to take the degree with you, right? So this, the generator here is of degree n because it's the one that lives here in my degree n component. Um, and this is really, really easy to compute just from the, from the cellular uh, cohomology, homology, whatever, from this balloon picture where you have one zero cell and a huge um, n cell that you just glue to it. And that's just the whole complex is basically zero. And that's how you how you can actually prove this. Slight catch here, and I'm going to ignore this in this video. Um, so in this setup of cohomology rings, you usually have a, a graded commutative ring. So I should, I should be a little bit careful with some science involved here. So it's not quite right. Write this here if n is odd. Uh, for a graded commutative ring because the polynomial ring doesn't make sense for, for an n is odd uh, generator. Why? Because you would have something like x times x if you change that order because of, well, graded commutativity. You, of course, just get x times x because there is no order involved, but you get a minus one to the n, um, which is a problem. So n is a degree, which is a problem, um, of course, if n is odd. So kind of I should write exterior algebra everywhere. In this case, it doesn't really matter. And I'm going to ignore that a little bit. Please keep that in mind. Cohomology rings are always graded commutative. There's always a sign going on as soon as you're in odd degree. Um, but anyway, so this is pretty nice. Uh, so the cohomology ring of the sphere, it's kind of the nicest quotient you can imagine um, from the polynomial ring in one generator, which I, I like pretty much. Um, so here's another set of examples which one could try to remember. It's also pretty beautiful, and it follows from um, the intersection picture of cohomology. So let's that, let's have a look at actually how it works. So um, in almost all good situations, you can identify the generators of the cohomology, homology, whatever. You can identify them with nice submanifolds. Um, of course, here in my picture of genus G equals three. I have the uh, submanifolds given by ABC, whatever, and so on. And the cohomology counts how they intersect. So each one of them correspond to one generator. So I have a generator X1 up to X2G. Uh, so in my picture here, of course, uh, six of them. 
and they have this property that they commute up to the sign. Okay, who cares? There's a sign involved. There's usually they of degree one because, as you can see, they're one-dimensional submanifolds, and they intersect in exactly the same thing up to a sign, namely the point itself which in then in the dual picture, this intersection ring picture is always a bit tricky in one sense, because in some sense, because you should really take to the dual picture of Poincaré duality, they intersect in a point, which in Poincaré duality means they intersect in the whole manifold, which means um, they all give the same result. So that's how I would like to think about this, this polynomial space here. It's a quotient of a polynomial ring by an anti-commutativity relation, fine. That's what had just that's just what happens in cohomology anyway. Cohomology rings, um, together with, for example, any any product of them which is not a times a or b times b or c times c. So no 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 double products, but something like a times b or a times c or a times d up to a sign is the same result. So in my notation, I would like to think of as I said of x i's as being the classes of the loops. Right. So each one of them corresponds to a loop. And this funny product that I've chosen, it's just any anyone, any of those products, x1 and x2, corresponds to the beast itself in homology. I said again, why? Because, well, the two corresponding loops intersect in this point, and by Poincaré duality, the point is actually the whole manifold. That's how you do it. Um, if you don't want to think about intersection rings, so this is just the answer. And I think it's a reasonably nice answer for a space uh, of high genus, right? So, uh, Two, two G generators, they anti-commute um, and they kind of square to the same thing whenever that makes sense. Okay, um, another standard example, also really beautiful result, extremely simple. So here it is, uh, the cohomology ring of the real projective plane. Because of some sign issues involved and this is non-orientable sometimes, sometimes it is, it's kind of better to work uh, not integrally here, but with Z mod two coefficients, as uh, the integral solution is linked in the description. So the integral answer is linked in the description, and the answer is pretty simple, and it's it, it can be uh, proven in the same way. Just think of the submanifolds of an RPN as being several RPNs again. So for, for RP five, you have submanifolds from RP one, so non-trivial ones, from RP one, RP two, RP three, RP four, and they intersect in a nice way in such a way that you can identify those um, those classes with the generator X here, which is, of course, this one is of a degree one, as you can see, it's a one-dimensional submanifold, and in such a way that you kind of square yourself until, uh, so you take a square, you take the third power, the fourth power, until you, hit, you get too big, because at one point you hit the whole manifold, and in this case, for n equals five, you hit the whole manifold, and the next power should be zero, because the homology is, is zero anyway. And that's exactly what happens. It's pretty simple to prove, actually, if you know this intersection picture of um, uh, the real projective space, or in general, this, this intersection picture. And the result is extremely nice. It's a polynomial ring. It's again our good old quotient polynomial ring modulo a power of x. Slightly different than from for the sphere, it's polynomial ring modulo a power of x, um, where n, the power of x, depends on, on the uh, space. And this is kind of the same for all of these uh, projective spaces. For the complex projective spaces, it's even nicer because you don't worry about any signs anymore and just you can work it integrally. Slight catch you, because it's complex, right? You double everything. You start in dimension two, so the generator is actually of degree two if you want to call that a catch. Anyway, so the point is here. Uh, Cohomology rings of projective spaces are ridiculously nice. They are the nicest polynomial quotients you can imagine um, any, anywhere. And so here's now my list. We'll stay on the slide for a while, and the slides are any, uploaded anyway. So, in case you want to have a look, a link in the description. So, um, this is kind of the list I would like to keep in mind when I, when I first work on cohomology or whatever. Kind of the list I would like to know. The cohomology of spheres, we discussed this, there's nice quotients. Uh, note here again that the degree of the element depends on the, the dimension of the, of the sphere. The torus, beautiful. The torus, beautiful. It's just the exterior algebra and two generators. And yes, the two generators of the torus are the two fundamental classes uh, going around in one direction, going around in the other direction along the torus. It's exterior algebra. I showed you RP2 in the disguise uh, of an RPN. So RP2 is just x mod x cubed. 
also pretty good results. So it's not a sphere, as you can see, the sphere would be x mod x squared, x mod x cubed. Again, some z mod 2 coefficients are a little bit better here. But anyway, you could prove that in a very similar way, as I said. Uh, similar for the Klein bottle, you can think of the fundamental generators of the Klein bottle if you want. Again, there's a z mod 2 action, uh, a z mod design thing going on. And well, the result is reasonably nice anyway. It's a, it's a Klein bottle. So I wouldn't expect too much. It's not so, so bad. Um, the picture for the orientable surfaces is pretty nice. As I said, it's really just this intersection picture of the corresponding fundamental generators. And what you get is a, kind of a nice quotient of a polynomial ring up to some side issues of, of side issues as usual. It's cohomology, there will be some side issue. Real and projective spaces, beautiful polynomial rings, uh, modulo the obvious one, uh, so the obvious quotients of polynomial rings. Slight catch is that the degree varies a little bit here. Whatever. Um, so all of these are reasonably easy to prove. And also for the various topological groups that you can come up with, the unitary group, the special unitary group, the uh, symplectic group, they are not, the, the cohomology rings are pretty nice and not so hard to prove uh, what they are. So they're exterior algebras, as you can read here. Uh, in, in certain types of generators. Uh, so the degree, so the uh, subscript here indicates the degree of those generators. It's really not so hard to prove. Turns out that there's one example, which is not so easy to prove, which I will briefly discuss on the next slide. So the only one that doesn't quite really fit into the sequence of, oh, we have a nice exterior algebra here for those topological groups, unitary groups, special unitary, symplectic, whatever, is the special orthogonal group. And that's, that's a little bit more complicated. And actually to prove it is also not trivial, uh, link in the description. So the special orthogonal group, the, the group of um, rotations of um, end space. Um, so kind of, it, it depends a little bit whether you work over R or, or over C. Let me be a little bit hand wavy here and let me, let me do the one here over. This is a picture over R, so the group of rotations over R. Um, you know some examples of this, so we'll discuss this in a second to n equals two, n equals three. Um, and it turns out that this is not so bad. It's just a little bit hard to compute. So it's a tensor product, uh, graded tensor product in this in this usual sense of that you have a sign here, the z mod two to get rid of the sign if you want, of um, the usual quotients. So it's the usual quotient by something like an x to the k, um, but the k kind of depends on uh, the generator, whatever that means. Anyway, and it's actually not so hard to prove. It, it, it's okay if you know the cell structure of SO. Um, in Hatcher, there's a whole chapter about this. So it's, it's also not so trivial to prove, but anyway. And basically it comes from that SO is kind of the same as RPN in some sense, um, because well, uh, a rotation, that's what, what SO is talking about, is kind of determined by a rotation axis up to a sign because the axis doesn't really know the sign doesn't know the, the direction. So the rotation doesn't know the direction of the axis. And this is kind of saying that SO, these special orthogonal groups are not very far away from um, being real projective sp spaces. And for example, for n equals three, this is actually true. So SO3 is homo homeomorphic to RP3 by some Euler angle type of theorem. And then let's, let's um, look at this example in those cases. So here, uh, the degree in both cases is just one. But there's this funny jumping of, of, of quotients. So he has x squared and he has x to the four. And this just comes from this condition that you have here that um, you kind of take the minimal power such that um, the corresponding two, two to the whatever gets bigger than n. And well, now it depends whether n is two or, th or three, right? You need to want to be bigger than n. So the power is either a two or four. And this gives you a good flavor of how those things work. You get more generators like this, but basically it's always x to the two, x to the four, x to the eight, something like that, that you mod out. Um, okay, so we have seen a lot of cohomology rings. Uh, most of them are nice quotients of polynomial rings like spheres, tori, like, or exterior algebras like tori, um, orientable surfaces, even more sophisticated groups like son, basically are just zx mod to some power of x. It's pretty nice. So cohomology ring, and there's some subtle differences in those cohomology rings, which then help you distinguish those spaces like the degree of the generator or what precise power you take. Uh, really beautiful. Remember that actually the ring structure, the graded ring structure itself is an invariant. 
so if the degree is 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 off, but the space looks very similar, it's it's still not the same space because it's a graded invariant, right? So you have to be a bit careful. You need to take everything into account. The grading and the ring structure itself. Anyway, so I really like this list, and it's kind of all you need to know about a cohomology rings. This is of course whatever whatever that means, right? All you need to know about. There are other nice cohomology rings which are not so trivial to prove anymore. Cohomology rings of Grassmannians, for example which are related to symmetric polynomials. Really beautiful story. But this is kind of the list you should keep in mind um, if you do those things for the, but maybe not for the first time, but at least for the second time, kind of those cohomology rings that always look like, or um, the, the, you should keep the flavor in mind, right? They always look like an exterior algebra or polynomial ring quotient, kind of always the same flavor type, type of flavor of ring. Anyway. Um, I hope you enjoyed the list. I hope you enjoyed the video and I also hope to see you next time.